Okay, this is Texas History, uh, and this is a continuing lecture on the geography and anecdotal stories about various parts of Texas, uh, particularly with a modern twist and a modern feel. And uh, in the last lecture, we were in the uh, East uh, Texas portion of the state, uh, kind of between the Natchez and the Trinity River Valleys. Uh, the last uh, little story and vignette I told you uh, was about uh, New London. But here today and in this lecture, we're going to continue with the Trinity River and continue to move westward across Texas and move through uh, the uh, geography of Texas. So I guess well, this next uh, lecture, uh, this next uh, place we're going to talk about is uh, home to many of you who are watching this, or whether that is uh, Dallas or Fort Worth, but you're home to the Metroplex, and as you should know, uh, you are on the Trinity River, uh, the very upper reaches of it, of course, uh, but downtown Dallas is uh, split, or at least say it like this, downtown Dallas is uh, uh, buffeted by the Trinity River as it bet passes between the downtown business district and Oak Cliff. So, uh, and the same is true for uh, the Fort Worth. I believe it's the West Fork of the Trinity River that runs through downtown. It's nothing impressive. It's not as uh, grand as the uh, San Antonio River, I guess you could say. Certainly not like the Mississippi or anything of that nature. Uh, but all that to say, though, is it allows me to talk about Dallas and Fort Worth for a few minutes. And uh, I do this occasionally in class, and I will pick on students uh, a little bit uh, for it. But uh, here in this, uh, this uh, recorded environment, you can kind of get the feel for it as well. Especially for those of you who live in the Dallas and Fort Worth area uh, and live there long enough to get the feel, especially as my experience has been, especially if you're from Fort Worth, uh, you get the notion and you understand rather quickly that there is a rivalry between the two cities. Uh, Dallas is urbane, cosmopolitan, um, very wealthy in places, obviously very poor in others, uh, very Eastern. And um, what I mean by that by Eastern, they over the years in its history, it has looked to the East Coast of the United States, uh, New York for finance, perhaps Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C. for political influence, of course. Uh, arguably maybe in recent years looking to Los Angeles for uh, some culture or something of that nature, certainly for business. But Dallas, uh, if uh, we're to use the expression of what does a Texan look like, uh, we might draw a, t uh, a Dallas Texan. And what I mean by this is a stereotypical Texan sort of thing. What is uh, And the thing that all of you have been asked before, what, did, uh, what do you wear? Uh, do you have electricity and so forth? Where's your cowboy hat? So if you were to draw a Dallas Texan over the years, uh, you would see a Dallas Texan who, uh, if we were to use those stereotypes, he might be wearing a, uh, a felt hat, kind of a short-brimmed affair. He'd certainly be in a three-piece suit or certainly at least a, a double-breasted suit, and uh, he'd look like he was a banker. He might have cowboy boots on. In a, in a sense, but certainly in a more modern sense, he would not be wearing any of that, but he would look uh, somewhat undistinguishable from somebody in uh, maybe Philadelphia, New York, or the uh, Chicago, some of the more urbane cities. Uh, all that to say, though, is, is that he cuts a certain figure, or she cuts a certain figure, uh, kind of a, a wine, a wine drinking, a very classy, upscale beer sort of idea. You get the picture I'm trying to paint with a very broad brush, and I understand that there are people who do not fit that uh, that uh, mentality or that look in Dallas, and maybe it's a very small, ultimately a smaller segment of society in that city. Uh, but they are oftentimes the elite part of Dallas, and you see it uh, reflected in the advertisements for Dallas, the advertisements for the, uh, the cosmopolitan parts of Dallas. Uh, I think of Highland Park, University Park, some of the park cities, of course, uh, in a general sense. You see the uh, high-rises, the condos, those sorts of things, very, very modern, very urban. Uh, whereas the Fort Worth, on the other hand, uh, doesn't look at itself so much that same way. Now, Fort Worth has a rivalry with Dallas, and it's arguable does Dallas even recognize Fort Worth other than just a, uh, uh, you know, the younger brother, or the the, the uh, ugly sister, or something like that. Uh, pardon me how I say it, but basically I'm trying to get you to understand uh, at least my experience historically and, and literally because I did live in Dallas for a year in the early part of this uh, century. The fact was is that Dallas kind of ignored Fort Worth is uh, just, you know, who's what's Fort Worth? Oh, yeah, that's that's a roughneck town. It's just kind of uh, bad. And, and if you've ever had any family who've gone out to West Texas, to Odessa and Permian, I believe uh, it was in this class or may have been another one as I'm recording this here recently uh, then I, that was from Od from Midland. And I asked him, I said, what's it like to live in Midland? What do you think of Odessa? Uh, and it was said about 
Midland as you raise your kids in Midland and you raise hell in Odessa. Uh, that rivalry between those two cities in West Texas is somewhat analogous as the rivalry between Fort Worth and Dallas. Fort Worth uh, has uh, always uh, in its history, even before it was a major metropolitan city like it is today, Fort Worth has always looked westward. It's uh, kind of been a western uh, flair of a city. It's almost, uh, I think they even have the uh, statement on their uh, on their letterhead where the West begins and there's some truth in that I mean even to this day in downtown Fort Worth you have the great uh, stockyards and you know they they talk about that and there was a lot of cattle that was moved through there in years gone by uh, but for convention and uh, visitors effect they play up the western motif uh, West Texas the cowboy hat the dusty cowboy hat maybe uh, not felt or if it's felt it's a very big brimmed hat certainly doesn't look like a banker's hat it looks like it's been in some uh, look like it's worked uh, maybe a, a straw hat or something like that but certainly if you've ever been to Fort Worth in the say around noontime I think it is they're going to uh, uh, have the cattle drive the quote unquote cattle drive into the stockyard it's it's a it's a can affair but it's there to make the the visitors and the conventioners feel good and homey obviously in downtown fort worth you have billy bob's texas which is a big old honky-tonk dance hall uh, that it that too is uh something you may find in dallas but you got to look hard and certainly not in downtown dallas at least to my knowledge i don't think there's anything like that there's much more urbane uh, pubs and and craft brewers in downtown dallas than at least uh, in my concept of fort worth and even if you just look at Fort Worth and you look at the uh, doors uh, on, the car, on the cop cars in Fort Worth, the memory serves, and I think it's still this way, they've got a big old longhorn head on the car, basically showing off that this is a cow town and, and that sort of thing there. So all of which is to say is, is that Fort Worth looks upon itself in a westward uh, sense. It's always kind of been in the shadow of Dallas. Uh, it, it's, uh, there is really a rivalry. And like I said, some of you are from Fort Worth and some of you are from the Dallas area. Uh, and you, uh, if you're observant and maybe you've seen it through your family, you've noticed that there is that sort of thing. If you're from, even if you're not from Dallas particularly, uh, but you're, say, from Addison or Plano, you would say, if someone say, where are you from? And they don't know where Addison or Plano is uh, or Mesquite or whatever, you'd say, I'm from Dallas. Uh, whereas somebody from perhaps uh, Weatherford, uh, that's I know that's in Parker County out west of there, but if you're from, uh, what was it, Alito or something of that nature, uh, Hearst, uh, you'd say I'm from Fort Worth. And like I said, they don't always play together too well. Uh, it was in the early days of Texas history, and I've kind of alluded it into a previous lecture about uh, the Galveston hurricane of 1900, the idea that there was going to be only two great cities in Texas because they don't know that what uh, the future holds, frankly, just like we don't. Uh, they can guess, but they don't know for, with uh, certainty. And of course, the hurricane changes all those calculations. But one of the thinkings was, is who's going to be the great interior city of Texas? Uh, what's going to be that great city that's going to, uh, to be the, uh, the counterbalance, if it were, to Galveston? And of course, I might have said a few minutes or a few uh, lectures ago, Waco was uh, along those lines there. Uh, but in addition to that, there was also thinking that Dallas would be the case. And so by the time you look to the late 19th century, and especially around the year 1900, Dallas is doing its ultimate best to become that great uh, interior city of Texas. And you see Dallas uh, try to accomplish that uh, through uh, various uh, things, such as the banking industry. That's a lot of money has been uh, put together in the Dallas uh, uh, in Dallas over the years, especially after World War II. Uh, arguably, World War II is when Dallas takes off, uh, but at the same time, maybe the Great Depression is what drove people off the farm and into Dallas to work, uh, or Dallas Fort Worth to work, but especially Dallas. But you see in the latter part of the 20th century and certainly into the 21st century, Dallas uh, positioning itself as the great uh, uh, financial and economic hub of Texas. One of the things that Dallas has also had a little bit of, and though they might not admit this at times, uh, at least not the way I'm going to say it, is, is that there has been over the years some, um, uh, I guess you could say, uh, uh, rivalry that it has. Uh, now, Dallas would not admit a rivalry with Fort Worth. I, I've, I've never really come across anybody that says, yeah, Fort Worth is our equal, uh, and really mean it. At least that's my experience. But Dallas, in a sense, is a, it has a rivalry in, uh, with Houston. 
Now, as, I, as you're watching this, you Houstonians in the room uh, or are watching this video uh, are thinking, well, yeah, and Houston, uh, if you talk to Dallas people and some of you Dallas people are thinking about this right now, it's like you think Houston is nasty, dirty, mudville. That's Galveston's old phrase for Houston. Uh, it is just full of mosquitoes and it's just topsy-turvy and on top of each other. It's just, uh, just a, a, you know, a lower cut of people overall. Never mind that Houston has the finest restaurants just like Dallas does. It has lots of money, uh, but there's just a different ethic and e uh, uh, pathos, uh, not pathos, ethic, eth ethos, I guess is the right word, but a different, different feeling for Houston uh, than, than Ga Dallas will give you. And so there is a rivalry, and, if you pr and some of it goes even to say uh, something as uh, seemingly superfluous as uh, sports. Uh, though ultimately sports, I think, isn't uh, that superfluous. Uh, it seems to be much more of a, uh, of a cultural bellwether than we'd like to sometimes give it credit for. But when you talk about uh, sports, say, take the Dallas Cowboys. And I sometimes jokingly call them in class the Dallas Cowgirls. Uh, but all that to say, it's all a joke. But uh, the Cowboys, uh, they call themselves America's team. And uh, you talk and press on a Houstonian a little bit, there are times you will see Houston feel like they're being ignored and uh, just not paid attention to like the Cowboys. The Texans don't get the love. And before that, there was the Houston Oilers, now the Tennessee Titans. The Oilers never got the love that the, the Cowboys did. Uh, the Cowboys won Super Bowls. They call themselves America's team. They had a stadium that had a hole in it. So why? Well, the joke was is so God himself could watch the Cowboys play football. Uh, on and on and on. And it just rubbed Houstonians the wrong way. And uh, Houstonians uh, might look at Dallas and say, what a bunch of plastic, feckless, uh, 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 just, um, just not really good Texan sort of uh, idea. But there's a rivalry that both cities have for each other. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a mutual hatred or anything of that nature, but it certainly is a tension. And one of the things it's fair to remember about Houston, and I'll just say this uh, very quickly, uh, is, is that Houston is going to be uh, uh, made by several things. First of all, the petrochemical industry, but really what makes Houston the great city is, of course, the ship channel. Now, the ship channel was dug out, as I've said before, in the afterwash of uh, the Galveston hurricane in 1900. About 1910, uh, Houston, which is uh, uh, especially after 1900, Houston was able to marshal its political capital together and was able to get the federal government to dig out the Buffalo Bayou. And by doing that, what Houston does is, is that it's basically able to convince the federal government in Washington, D.C. that if you want to have a, a, an important deep sea port on the southwestern, or excuse me, the northwestern corner of the Gulf of Mexico, the western Gulf in essence, you need to have a port that will not be destroyed by a hurricane. And the government bid on that logic, plus the lobbying that Houston had and so forth. And so the, the, the Houston Ship Channel is born, Buffalo Bay is dredged out, and as they say, the rest is history. Houston uh, takes off and grows. And of course, you throw in the air conditioner I've referred to before, uh, the petrochemical stuff. It's, it's just uh, Houston uh, gets going. But that caused some tension for Dallas, and Dallas looked at this as an opportunity for them to get a little piece of the, the transatlantic uh, international trade option. And so for basically from the 1920s or the 1930s all the way up until the year 2005 or so, you would hear Dallas every so often, once a generation, once a decade, uh, send up this trial balloon about how we need to dig out the Trinity River, how we need to dredge out and widen the Trinity River in, in order to allow barge traffic to go up the Trinity and go all the way to Dallas so you could have a port at Dallas. And if you think about that, that would mean Dallas, which is about 200 and probably about 250 miles. I'd have to look at a map and get a, or do a Google search on it. But from Galveston to Dallas is a long way. Say two, at least it's 200 miles, maybe 250 miles. But that would be the idea is, is that you'd be able to have ocean going, maybe not uh, big container uh, traffic coming in like you see at Corpus or at Houston, but you would have barge traffic and take uh, containers up the Trinity River, which uh, if you've ever crossed the Trinity River on I-45 in Dallas, it, that's a mess. It stinks to high heaven. I used to ride a motorcycle and it stunk like a uh, you know, thousand uh, billion dead polecats sort of deal. But uh, between Houston's uh, re reluctance and, frankly, refusal to allow Ga Dallas to try to take some of their business and the fact that it's, uh, it would cost uh, an, extra uh, an exorbitant amount of money. 
and the only person, the only group that's going to give you that sort of money to dig that thing is the federal government. Uh, it never has happened. A less ambitious project for the Trinity River in Dallas has been also over the years a desire to turn the Trinity River down just south of downtown and north of Oak Cliff to turn that into a tourist destination, something akin to the San Antonio River. And so the San Antonio River, meaning uh, the river walk in San Antonio. Well, all that to say is, is that uh, that too, uh, because of uh, in Dallas here, I don't think would Dallas would ever say that they have uh, they were on the same footing with San Antonio. I could be wrong there. But again, that kind of we're superior uh, to, the, to the rest of you sort of thing. At least that's, again, been my experience historically and in, in person in life. Uh, but there has been a rivalry that there's so much tourism that goes to San Antonio because, amongst other things, that Riverwalk, that Dallas needed a cut of the action as well. And so let's have ourselves what they've called over the years some version of the Trinity River Project, which basically means let's turn the Trinity River into a, a Riverwalk. Again, uh, not enough money, not enough support, uh, hard to do, uh, just, uh, just a lot of things working against that. They have tried in the last 20 years. Maybe they've gotten a little better, but it's not exactly taken off either. So uh, Dallas has had some rivalries and at times may not have admitted that. But back to our, my original point about rivalry between Dallas and Fort Worth, you're going to get that between those two cities. The year would be important in this case here because it's kind of one of those uh, bellwether years in our history. It's 1936. In 1936, the city of Dallas and more particularly the state of Texas was celebrating the centennial of the Texas Revolution. And so in 1936, Dallas uh, is uh, going to lobby and be blessed with because they had the money to support it and the political uh, will to get, or excuse me, the political support to get it. They, they got one of the two official centennial celebration uh, places, as, uh, locations, I should say. The state of Texas was going to have two. One was going to be at Washington on the Brazos right down the road from here uh, where they signed the Declaration of Independence on March 2nd, 1836. And then uh, there was going to be a second, more a larger and ornate uh, uh, celebration. Cities bid on it, but Dallas got it. And so Dallas uh, went to work and went to work in a hurry uh, to put together a centennial celebration uh, befitting a city that itself was starting to really come into its own, the great eastern city of Dallas, Texas. Uh, so some of you actually have been there. Some of you may actually kind of know the outlines of the story. If you've ever been to the State Fair of Texas in Dallas, which is a great time, it's a great uh, thing. And here with 2020, for what a year it is, there is no State Fair this year. Anyways, the State Fair of Texas in 2020, excuse me, the State Fair of Texas is located on the grounds of the old Centennial Park. And in fact, it's still called that Centennial Park. Uh, all those buildings, or at least the vast majority of those buildings on Fair, in Fair Park or Centennial Park in Dallas, uh, or really it's Fair Park, I guess you could say, but where they had the Centennial, most of those buildings were built by the federal government as a WPA project or a PWA, which were two New Deal uh, programs, Works Progress Administration, Public Works Administration. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt himself will come and speak there at Dallas uh, and uh, give a uh, hearty welcome and be welcomed heartily, uh, you know, the p normal politician stuff. Uh, that you get with those uh, sorts of events. And it was an urbane, at least initially, it was going to be urbane, high culture, highbrow, lectures on Texas history, lectures on Texas culture. I mean, it's like a college class in some respects, museum pieces, art pieces, uh, symphony orchestras, uh, uh, ballet dancing. Uh, and some of you watching this are like, oh my gosh, that sounds good. But if I had to bet most of you watching this says, oh my gosh, this sounds boring. Now, Foreign is Fort Worth, excuse me, is going to look at the, what was making up in Houston and it burned Fort Worth up. They could, they didn't get it. So Fort Worth announced that they too were going to have a celebration. It was the unofficial celebration of the state of Texas's 100th anniversary as a uh, independent uh, nation from Mexico or independent state from Mexico. The fact of the matter is Fort Worth uh, decided, uh, no, we're going to do it differently. We're going to do it Fort Worth style. We're going to have ourselves a party. We're going to party it up, and we're going to have a good time. We're and not going to do what Dallas does. If you want to have lectures and high culture, go to Dallas. If you want to have fun and lowbrow, lowbrow is a negative term, I grant you, but if you want to have fun, come to Fort Worth. Uh, 
And so uh, the man in question, I think you need to write his name down because here in uh, Fort Worth, uh, his name is everywhere. And those of you from Fort Worth or have friends who went to, or ha are going to TCU or Texas Christian University uh, or uh, just, you know, done business over the years or families uh, travel to Fort Worth on occasions, you've seen this name all over the place in Fort Worth. And that name is Eamon Carter. Eamon Carter. Last I checked, Eamon Carter Stadium is still a thing in, on the TCU campus. I know it's been renovated. We've got Eamon, Eamon Carter uh, Driveway or the Boulevard or something like that. You've got the Eamon Carter Coliseum. Uh, Eamon Carter was a newspaper man and on top of that kind of Mr. Fort Worth, meaning he was the chief promoter <coughs> Excuse me, of Fort Worth. I mean, just a, a massive promotion of the city uh, on an, a large, large scale. And so Eamon Carter is... Uh, not going to sit down and let Fort Dallas get all the accolades and the glories. So Carter, what he does is he goes out and hires not uh, museum people. He hires uh, essentially uh, entertainers, folks who are going to have a good time and know how to put on a good time. And in fact, actually, the more risque aspects of what happened in Fort Worth is that you could see... Uh, uh, women dance uh, and dance with very few clothes on. And this was part of the unofficial official celebration at Fort Worth. Uh, you say, where did I get this from? Well, I saw it on a newsreel that was uh, out of Fort Worth in that same time period. In addition to that, what they started to notice is 1936 unfolds and people are traveling to go to these uh, displays. Uh, crowds are flocking to Fort Worth for the fun and for the dancing. Uh, and not talking about the dirty dancing, I'm talking about the cleaner dancing. They're, uh, they're there for the, the cold beer. They're here there for the western swing or for the ragtime music or whatever the entertainment was. But it was entertaining and the crowds were flocking into Fort Worth and were just running circles around the high art and the high culture of Dallas. And so what Dallas does is it goes off and hires its own uh, choreographers and, and folks, and they start calling in the, the dancers, and it's, it's really kind of, a, 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 in a sense, a humorous, silly, uh, lascivious at times uh, a rivalry when Dallas is trying to play catch-up with Fort Worth there in 1936 in the great uh, celebration of Texas's independence. So to, uh, to sum it all up, in a sense, and Dallas is a, is a major city, 1.2 million or something like that, and Fort Worth is a major city in its own right, 800,000. All, But in some respects, if you want to think of these two cities, one looks to the east, that's Dallas. One looks to the west, that's Fort Worth. And so ultimately, what it boils out to, what it boils out to is, is that... Uh, Two cities, neighbors, Dallas-Fort Worth, rarely ever Fort Worth-Dallas unless it's WBAP uh, who out of, out of that territory would do this. But uh, these two cities, next door and neighbors, look very differently, across, look at each other and dismiss each other and look to the west, look to the east, but they rarely look at each other with a longing eye. So uh, that takes care of that. And so we move on to uh, another piece of uh, territory. Uh, we're not ready to get to the Brazos River just this moment, but another body of water that's uh, not really a river, but we want, want to mention it because it is important, and that is Buffalo Bayou. Down to Houston we go. And so when I talk about Houston more, I'll, I'll save my, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about it here. But Houston, of course, as I said, was built, uh, especially blew up, uh, meaning grew up, blew up, uh, during the 1940s because of the World War. Uh, it started in the 1930s, but it accelerated greatly in the 1940s, the early 40s, when the World War was getting underway. And because of allies, the Allies uh, buying material and supplies from the United States hand over fist, the United States' uh, economic capacity started to grow and blow up as well. In fact, actually, as I've said before uh, in class or to you, uh, the Great Depression did not end because of any government program. The Great Depression ended because of World War II. It put people to work. And even this is before the United States gets involved. But after we get involved, Houston grows all the more. There are many, many uh, farmers, young men, who, never, who weren't drafted. Uh, some uh, mi old middle-aged men like myself. I, I guess I should say middle-aged about me now because I'm 43 at this recording. But the fact is, is they moved to Houston for more money, for a better life, etc. Another city that grows up in that part of the world there that is directly influenced by the ship channel, directly influenced by the petrochemical industry, is the city of, well, is Texas City. 
Uh, Texas City, uh, if some of you have been by there, uh, Texas City is a place I would never go to uh, to go fishing. That's just my opinion. Uh, I, a little too much petrochemicals uh, in the water sort of deal. Um, all that to say, though, is that Texas City has been a, uh, a, at times a jewel and certainly an important cog in the refining capacity of the United States. Uh, at this point in time, let's say it like this, uh, gasoline and other, ref other refineries, uh, I say kerosene, diesel, jet fuel, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, all those different uh, refineries there along the ship channel and down at Texas City uh, refine or like is the major refining uh, center in the United States. There are others that rival it, rival, rival it somewhat. Uh, New Orleans a little bit. Beaumont and Port Arthur has a lot of refining capacity. Even Corpus Christi, just uh, for some local examples. Uh, but at the same time, but Dallas, or rather the Houston Ship Channel and Galveston Bay, that's, that's the hub. That's the, the mother load of refining in the United States. So if you had a big hurricane come in and shove a whole bunch of water up into the ship channel, uh, you would see uh, gas uh, and oil prices spike, all, uh, spike pretty badly just because it would uh, cripple. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about a big hurricane, one of those once in a century sorts of things. Uh, it would cripple uh, the the refining capacity of the United States for a period. It, it would really it would cause some major troubles. Anyways, the reason I bring this all up, though, is to talk about 1947. And uh, 1947 is a pretty bad year for Texas City. Texas City grew up overnight, almost literally. The, the World War had a hand in that, and they threw docks together. They built refineries together. I mean, they built them up, boom, boom, boom. We need them, and we need them now. Well, how do we build them? Build them as quickly as possible. What's the plans? We don't have any. Just do it. And so what you end up doing is you build up these refineries overnight, quickly and as fast as possible, and the docks and the wharves that are going to handle and load ships, uh, offload ships and load up ships with ammonium nitrate, uh, fuels, etc., and everything else, uh, those docks are right on top of each other. I mean, right next to each other sort of thing. And in 1947, uh, memory serves, it was in April or so of 47. You can check the exact month. I'm not really worried about that. But it was 1947 when it occurred. Um, the, uh, there was a ship called the, uh, the, uh, the Grand Comp. It was, um, it was being loaded with ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Modium nitrate fertilizer is a great fertilizer. It is uh, really what makes uh, some land that is barely arable, arable, and arable land uh, great. Uh, I mean, just honestly, I mean, how many people watching this have had their parents hand them a bag of fertilizer and say, spread it out in the backyard, we need to get the fertilizer out. Uh, and it was, it's frankly, ammonium nitrate fertilizer of some stripe or another. Anyways, this uh, tanker, or this uh, cargo ship, excuse me, called the Grand Comp was uh, going to France, and it was being loaded with ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Well, anyways, uh, the story is this, is that in the, as the morning unfolds and this thing is being loaded, and frankly being loaded by hand, you had these longshoremen doing the work down in the hull of the ship. Uh, in 1947, people smoked and smoked a lot of cigarettes, tobacco cigarettes. And they, uh, they smoked in uh, various places, sometimes places we would never think of smoking today, and others were like, well, that's just what people did in 1947. Well, evidently, somebody dropped a cigarette or something like that and didn't pay any attention or, did, or dropped it, meant to put it out and forgot about it, and this cigarette caused one of these bags of ammonium nitrate to catch on fire. And by the time they recognized the issue, uh, the fire was starting to grow. So uh, it was big enough that the, the question is, how do you put this fire out? And the answer should have been, take your extinguisher and put that thing out. Well, and I mean extinguisher, I mean several extinguishers, because I don't want to make it sound like it was a little old trash can fire. It, it, it grew rather quickly. Well, the problem with it, putting uh, it out with extinguishers or fire suppressant system or whatever is, is that you're going to spray a whole lot of water and chemical all over this fertilizer and ruin the cargo. And the captain of the Grand Comp basically said, I don't want to ruin my cargo. It's going to cost me and the company money. Let's do it this way. Batten down the hatches, seal it off, and suffocate it. 
But the problem was is the fire had already taken on a life of its own. And the, the issue was is the fire was growing and, and getting hotter and hotter. So what it does is it, instead of suffocating the fire, it has the perverse effect of making the fire get hotter and it heats the hull up. And it basically turns this uh, sealed off cargo hull into a gigantic pressure cooker. And so as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, uh, they abandon the ship. They call in the vi- in Texas City, 1947, just had a volunteer fire department. They have a uh, they have the uh, the volunteer fire department throwing water and whatever they've got onto it. And this is like 50, 60 people. They're throwing everything they've got at it, which ain't much even for the time period. Uh, and you can see the plumes. Uh, I mean, it was sealed off, but it wasn't sealed off completely. The fire was uh, completely it was un- unable to exhaust. And you could see the, this ammonium nitrate cloud burning out, and people at the various uh, chemical plants, one of which was Monsanto, started to say, what is that? And the, the scientist and the chemist said, yeah, that's, uh, that's an ammonium nitrate fire. That's, uh, that's on the docks. I might go check that out. Uh, you also are going to have some bystanders, which everybody loves to do, it seems like, in the middle of, an, uh, of a noteworthy event. People rubberneck, and they check, and they look, and they come by and check it out. Uh, one survivor of the event, uh, he said, I was headed there, uh, but I got cold feet, and I, I didn't want to skip school, and I turned around and went back, and it frankly saved his life. Uh, because you're going to have kids, seniors in high school sort of thing, uh, who had cars or trucks in 1947. They were youngins, and they went out to check it out. And Well, anyways, um, but uh, by about, I think it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, the uh, Grand Kampf went from uh, being on fire and hot to finally it, the, the combination was right and the thing exploded. Uh, the explosion was so great that it destroyed the ship, just blew it out of the water. It was like a, a bomb had gone off in the center of uh, Texas City, or at least the docks of Texas City. Uh, the explosion was so great and the force was so great, it knocked down and knocked over uh, buildings, uh, blew out windows uh, for about 50 miles. Uh, you felt the uh, explosion in downtown Houston. Uh, and that's uh, uh, not about 40 miles, 50 miles away and uh, uh, destroyed about half or a, you know, about a third of the city, a third of Texas City, uh, killed a whole bunch of individuals in the process. One fella uh, who was uh, telling a survivor account, he was headed over there to check it out, and he, was, he, was, uh, he worked for, as a mid-level or upper-level executive for Monsanto, and he was going to check it out and see what was going on to offer any assistance. And uh, when the explosion happened, uh, it threw his car up into the air. He, he, he said, I can clearly remember this. I, the car's in the air, and he, t- he said, I turned it off, put it into uh, neutral, and I jumped out of the car, and he fell like 25 feet. Um, survived. Then on top of that, a, a plane that was flying overhead, the concussive blast was so great it knocked the plane out of the sky. It picked up uh, rail cars and threw them into places. Uh, it was just a total destruction. You can see the pictures. It looks like someone had bombed out of World War II uh, there in Texas City. It, it was nothing more than an accident. It was nothing more than just, uh, uh, I won't say incompetence, uh, but certainly uh, missteps and misjudgments. And maybe I'm being too generous, but certainly it was, uh, it was bad. And it, it killed a bunch of people, put their eyes out too, and, and what have you. Uh, and it, it set a bunch of places, it set half the city on fire, basically, including another ship that was filled with ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And it, too, later that evening at about 8 or 9 o'clock that night, blew up as well. And that one was called the High Flyer. Now, the damage, in a sense, had already been done. But uh, what had happened in Texas City was that those two ships filled with ammonium nitrate uh, were essentially two uh, gigantic explosions that wrecked part of the city. Um, and it's also worth noting as well when you talk about the, uh, the explosion at Texas City, uh, the explosion itself is going to kill 576 people at least, but there are a lot of folks who were never accounted for and never found, so you expect, frankly, that number is higher. Um, a couple of the guys, uh, this one fellow I remember seeing the interview, it would have been in the 1990s when he gave it, when he was an older man, but he said one of the things he had to do was he had to go and identify some of his friends because their bodies were so blackened uh, by the explosion you couldn't tell uh, you couldn't you know they were burned basically you couldn't figure out who they were and this one guy said uh, he's like I, I recognized my buddy he was dead but I recognized him because of the watch he had on and he, he was very proud of it and 
Texas was poorer then, but he was very proud of his new watch, and uh, he, he saw the watch, and he knew it was uh, his friend. Um, but anyways, it was uh, a nasty thing. Uh, they rebuilt Texas City, as you well know, and uh, Texas City uh, still has, and for that matter, the Houston Ship Channel has fires and explosions from time to time. Uh, but Texas City is kind of that bellwether. It's the, uh, the worst of them all. Uh, FYI, one last thing is, is that uh, you will also see the FBI uh, identify people through fingerprints, uh, really use fingerprints in mass numbers for the first time. Uh, secondly, and, and uh, kind of uh, interestingly because of medicine and medical history, uh, penicillin was new and penicillin was limited, and uh, penicillin, which is uh, the, one of the great equalizers, uh, the, the national stock of penicillin was uh, exhausted for a period of time because of the penicillin being sent to, uh, to Texas City to help uh, protect and to save the wounded and so on, and the, the injured. But the Texas City explosion is what can happen sometimes when you uh, get to playing uh, with chemicals and don't uh, do everything just right. Uh, uh, obviously, as I'm recording this, this is in 2020, as you know. The thing is, is that uh, when I saw the explosion at Beirut a few uh, weeks ago, and if uh, the, the reports out of Beirut are accurate, that it was an explosion of ammonium nitrate, well, or maybe if you think of Oklahoma City in 1995, uh, the fact of the matter is ammonium nitrate uh, does a lot of damage when it's in mass quantities, and you saw that in Beirut just a few months, weeks ago at the time of this recording. So we've had it here in Texas, and it reminded me of what I saw at Beirut, reminded me of Texas City. So we move on. So we move on to uh, other rivers and such, and uh, we'll conclude this lecture today with talking about the Brazos River for a few minutes. The Brazos River is uh, the longest interior river of Texas. It stretches at least in a notional sort of way from uh, west of Lubbock out there in the, in the, uh, on the Cap Rock all the way through, uh, through Possum Kingdom out west of Fort Worth down through Waco and, and Baylor University down through here, Brazos County, Texas A&M and so forth and eventually empties into the Gulf of Mexico at Freeport. Uh, Bay, uh, Bra the Brazos River is, uh, Los, uh, its uh, Spanish name was uh, Los Brazos de Dios, the arms of God. Why was it called that? And the reason, think, the, the reason is, or at least the thinking is, is that some Spanish explorers were passing through Texas somewhere in the very distant past, maybe 1500s or so. And uh, they were nearly out of water, they were at thirst, uh, and they were dying. And it, uh, they, they found the Brazos River, they found good water, they were, they were saved. And so they called them the arms of God, los Brazos de Dios. And so I have always said if I didn't have a, a family cemetery to be buried in, I might be buried in, meaning uh, my ashes sprinkled in uh, the Brazos River. I could be okay with being thrown into the arms of God. But at the same time, however, the Brazos River in its history has been the center of a lot of Anglo settlement in the Mexican and early American period of Texas history. Uh, there was a whole lot of cotton grown down in Brazoria County, uh, down southwest of Houston. Uh, the capital of Stephen F. Austin's colony is on the Brazos River, San Felipe de Austin. And so you will see a lot, a lot of uh, settlers make their way to the Brazos River to grow cotton and other agricultural products. The fact of the matter is when we talk about the Brazos River, it's fair to say that when you look at the Brazos, <coughs> excuse me, when you look at the Brazos River, uh, the Brazos uh, is going to, and I made this uh, reference in a previous lecture, the Brazos is going to flood on multiple occasions from essentially the years 1880 to 1940. Spectacularly, meaning the big floods on the Brazos River took place, and write these dates down, 1899, 1913, and 1921. And uh, 1899, it was a big rainstorm, and it caused a flood, killed some people, killed a bunch of animals, same sort of thing. In 1913, big rainstorms. It was just wet. It was in the wintertime, and the Brazos flooded all over the place. Uh, it was one of the stories and anecdotes out of that flood in 1913 was a guy was uh, riding his horse along the, uh, the river bank somewhere around here, meaning somewhere around Brazos County. And as he was riding by, he happened to look up in one of the trees, one of the pecans or something like that on the edge of the river, and looked up, and there was this mule hanging in it. And uh, he was you know, 15 feet up in the air above the riverbank, or at least 10 feet above the riverbank. So uh, that mule had gone by, and he'd gotten hung up in the tree or forced himself into it, and the river came out from underneath him, and there he was. 
uh, killed a bunch of people, killed a whole lot more animals. Again, this is Texas when it's rural and so it's kind of smallish. And in 1921, I referenced it before with a great flooding at Thrall uh, because of that 36 inches in 18 hours that fell out and it all went down the river uh, and caused a, a bit of a dust storm or at least rolled the dust up as the waters uh, flooded. And um, uh, it never rained where I am. It never rained at Snook or Bryan College Station or Texas A&M or anything like that, yet it flooded. The dry flood in 1921. And then you have minor events on the Brazos River. And I posed the question to you in a previous lecture about why did the river flood so much in those years from 1880 to 1940? And why did it stop? Well, the students, uh, and you may be thinking, well, they built dams after 1940. And there is truth to that. Uh, there were dams built on the Brazos River and her tributaries, uh, her tributary rivers, uh, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s by the federal government for the most part. I mean, Lake Belton is an example. Up around northwest of, of Waco on, is Lake Whitney. Uh, you'll see Possum Kingdom in the same idea. You'll see uh, Somerville Lake in the same idea. You basically build all these dams and you control the flooding. So that's part of the story. But why did uh, flooding take off on the Brazos prior to uh, eight, after 1880? And the answer is going back to cotton is the issue of cotton. And so cotton is, uh, what it does is that cotton, when they, pl uh, they plow the ground for cotton, and it grows good uh, crop as long as it doesn't get rained on, but it grows great crop in Texas or along the banks of the Brazos River. Um, but cotton, uh, when it's plowed, or when you plow the land up for the crop, is going to tear up all that natural, uh, wonderful grass. Uh, some of the more... Uh, uh, noticeable grass in Texas uh, that is uh, out there is uh, what we call blue stem. Uh, it's really just kind of like shoots up in the air and when it's in its uh, undisturbed state and you've had plenty of rain, that blue stem can get as high as the belly of a horse. So I guess about three, four feet up in the air. Uh, you also had, by the way, in that time period along the Brazos River Valley, prior to uh, modern technology, modern planting and farming, modern coastal even, you had a lot of quail, which you don't see anymore. And all those quail could hide themselves in that uh, blue stem and other native grasses, and it was just a beautiful and wonderful uh, uh, environment for them. But if you've ever tried to pull blue stem or native grass up out of the Texas, out of, Braz out of the Brazos River uh, watershed, what you find is, is that all those, uh, those, that blue stem and those other, other native grasses, their, their roots are just like big old wads. And they go down, and it slows the water down. You don't have erosion. You don't have any of the problems. You don't have just runoff. Uh, so for those of you, say, down in Houston who have seen water flow quite a bit because of various tropical storms, rainstorms, and so forth, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, you see that, that water runs off quite quickly from uh, off of asphalt and especially concrete. A similar sort of phenomena exists when you plow the ground, if it, especially if you're plowing ground on the side of a hill to grow cotton. It just doesn't work very well and it causes flooding. So that's why you have these great floods. But this is the, uh, the home of the great cotton kingdom of Texas in the early days and even for the first 100 years of uh, cotton growth in Texas up until about 1920 or as late as 1930. Please put that in your notes. So cotton really kind of peters out in the Brazos River Valley, the lower valley or the upper valley toward Waco somewhere around the year 1930. The Great Depression kicks in, the rest of the story you know. Uh, but I also want to spend a moment, and I want you to put this in your notes as well, talking, and I'm going to kind of expand out of the Brazos River. And like I say, if I keep looking over my left shoulder, you're right as you see me. What I'm looking at is a map of Texas on the wall, and I'm just uh, thinking about all what I need to say to you. So if we talk about the Brazos River, and it, really if you wanted to take a, just uh, with a free hand in your notes, take and draw a picture of Texas as best you can. It don't have to be perfect. But geography, I think, does matter in Texas history and to be able to understand why Texas or Texans have done what they did or Texians that did, the, did what they did, you got to understand the geography of the state. Uh, talk about it in a meteorological sense with rain and you look at the state. But I want you to draw Texas, particularly with the major cities uh, in Texas on there. So particularly Dallas, Fort Worth up in the north, uh, Houston down along the coast in the Galveston Territory, San Antonio and Austin on the I-35 corridor, and maybe even throw in Corpus Christi down on the middle on the coastal bend for good reason, good measure. But generally speaking, the reason I'm asking you to do this, uh, and it obviously goes past the Brazos River, is because what, it, what you find in that part, that kind of that triangle that becomes a diamond, uh, you can call in your notes the Blackland Diamond. 
there are a lot of different uh, rock and land formations in Texas, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I do want you to get an understanding about why did they grow cotton where they did. Some of it has to do with proximity to the river and abundant water. But also it's fair, fair to remember that, that the Blackland Diamond, which is a type of soil, for those of you in Houston or in East, uh, come from East Austin or perhaps even uh, up around Waco or in the, some parts of the Dallas area, certainly around Corpus Christi, Blackland is uh, probably your experience with it, especially if you don't come from a farming background. Blackland is going to be what just made your dad spend $20,000 fixing the foundation of the house. Because Blackland, when it's wet, it expands and it's dry, it contracts and it does this. It's just like a big old accordion. And if you don't build your foundation correctly, if you, the uh, home builder was doing it as cheaply and as quickly as possible to build as much, and of course he knew it, the, the foundation wouldn't crack in the first year, so it, then he gets past his warranty period, he's in the, in the clear. If you don't build your foundation correctly, you're going to have problems in that Blackland. And even if you build it correctly, sometimes you still have problems with that Blackland. That would be likely where you've come into contact with it. It's called blackland because it's literally the color is black. I mean, it's a heavy, dense soil. It is great for growing crops. It's great for growing a garden. It's great for growing cotton. And so that blackland diamond that basically runs almost all the way to the Red River down to the eastern side of San Antonio and Austin on the east side of I-35, basically, because you really have a, a geographical division point right there, uh, down to Corpus Christi. Uh, if you're down around Corpus Christi, say around Tivoli, uh, parts of, uh, of Sinton in that area through there, you see cotton grown, and it's on black land. Now around Houston as well, down here. Now it's not, it's not uh, monolithic, it's not just everywhere, but you have these fingers of this black land that are growing. But the reason I, I, I go on and on about it is to make the point that cotton was the premier uh, economic activity of Texas in the 19th and the early 20th century. Those banks in Galveston prior to the storm, those banks in Dallas, uh, in a sense, after the storm, but before the, the, the World War, the Second World War, those banks, a lot of their money was made off of lending and loaning and, and uh, facilitating the growth and the production of cotton. Uh, especially Galveston, that's a, uh, certainly true. And you can see on the wharves of Galveston, all that cotton piled up that came out of central Texas from somewhere. They're going, getting ready to be loaded on ships and sent maybe to England, sent to New England and the, and the, uh, and the United States or something like that. So anyways, but the, the thing is, is that I want you to also make a little note of this as well, is, is that you can really tell how much money was made by um, cotton and how it affected a community. Uh, and one of the ways you do it is you look at the way people spend their money. Uh, is, is how people spend their money tells you what matters to them. Uh, so you might say it like this to be a little flippant and trite. Uh, where your checkbook is, there your heart is, is what, uh, also. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that when you talk about uh, spending money, and you talk about spending money uh, personally or as a community, in the modern times, I would argue what's most important in the hearts and the minds of a, of a lot of Texans, and, and for that matter, a lot of Americans. It's not completely true, but it's, I think, partially true. Uh, the issue has to be is that we spend money on entertainment. There's certainly that's true. You get entertained with, a, with the iPhone or whatever, this and so, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when you not only get entertained, uh, but you also get entertained in the form of sports, say uh, stadiums. I, I referenced it in the previous lecture about, or a earlier lecture anyways, about, a, about Arlington being able to spend, it's obviously a bigger city, but spend billions of dollars on in the last 25 years or 26 years on three sports stadiums, two of which are still in use. So that says that means a lot. I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying you, you kind of get an idea. Houston spent a lot of money on the Toyota Center a uh, decade and a half ago, the NRG a decade and a half ago to replace the Astrodome. The Texas A&M University spends a lot of money on Kyle Field, the renovation, for example. The University of Texas is no different, uh, and on and on I can go. Even some of you are thinking, well, what about my small town or even my uh, metropolitan area where they have a 15,000-seat high school football stadium that has luxury boxes, and, man, it's just like a, it's better than a lot of college stadiums in the Northeast or uh, in the Midwest even which is all true. 
So you spend your money in a 2020 or 21st century sort of way on sports, particularly. But in the, in the late 19th and the early 20th century, you didn't. It, 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 you may have built a stadium, but it was very primitive and simple. You may have built a gymnasium, but it was very primitive and simple. They spent their money elsewhere. Uh, their heart was found elsewhere, uh, and it was found uh, sometimes in churches. You'll find some of the most ornate Baptist churches, which is unusual because traditionally Baptists have eschewed uh, and have uh, pushed aside the idea of building a beautiful church because it kind of gets to the uh, roots of the Baptist movement. But those Baptist churches, especially like a First Baptist, which normally in a community, if you're not familiar with the Baptist movement or small town Texas, or even a big city like Dallas, but uh, when you say First Baptist Church, that normally means the church for lawyers and who are Baptists, lawyers, merchants, uh, the well-to-do, the middle class, and so on. And this is not always true, I grant you, but often is. Uh, in a town, First Baptist is for, for that class of people. And it's not like people, I'm going to be clear so you don't think I'm trying to dig the First Baptist, uh, meaning make a, make a shot at First Baptist. But the fact is, is that First Baptist is, most First Baptist will, you know, say, hey, welcome whoever will come through the door or they'll invite. Uh, but it's also understood too is that First Baptist caters to, generally speaking, caters to a certain type of person. Whereas, say, a Calvary Baptist, that would cater to more of a working class or blue collar sort of individual. And then you got maybe Second Street Baptist or this, whatever. And it's true also for the Methodist Church as well, First Methodist versus Cal, uh, Wesleyan Methodist or something. In the 19th century, the reason I'm picking, I'm saying I'm picking on, the reason I'm talking about Baptist and Methodist is because most Texans in the 19th century, the late 19th century after the Civil War, and even through, say, 1920 and 30, heck, oh, frankly, through most of the 20th century, but especially around the turn of the 20th century when they're building those churches, most people are Baptist or Methodist. And if you travel through a town, uh, you can look and see how wealthy a town is or was by the architecture that they have. And that's really one of the major points I want you to write down. You can tell how much money they had or have, present tense, by the houses and the architecture they have. So if you wanted to go through a town in Texas on the Blackland Diamond, what you're going to do is you're going to drive through there and say, well, what did it look like? Uh, if I were you, I'd ask you to look up a handful of counties and uh, in particular their county courthouses. You can figure out these courthouses and how much money they had there. Uh, let me use a name for you right quick to uh, complete my point. Uh, town of Calvert, Calvert, Texas, is uh, today kind of uh, hoping to catch fire as a, uh, a junk, I call it a junk haven, uh, but certainly catch fire as a antique haven. Calvert is about, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is getting weak. Calvert is about 40 miles or so northwest up Highway 6 on the way to Waco, maybe 35 from Brian Cod Station, but almost halfway to Waco. And there's not much going on up there. But at one point in time, Calvert was a cotton, little cotton hub on, in the Brazos River Valley. You find First Baptist Calvert, and that at one point in time, while it was still a wealthy com uh, community, you could tell First Baptist Calvert had had a lot of money, and they poured it into that church. It's also true for the Presbyterian Church across the street. You see all that. Um, so they would build uh, big churches and beautiful churches. You'd see stained glass, for an example, maybe a big pipe organ or something of that nature. Uh, depends on what they wanted. Uh, press tin if you go back into the past. But in addition to that, you'd also see, too, is you'd see a lot of big houses. Uh, those men and women, but especially normally men who were the, maybe not planters, maybe they were, but they certainly ran the gin or the processing mill or the seed mill or whatever. They had a lot of money, and they would build big houses. That's not unusual. One of the ways we uh, manifest our wealth is either buying a very expensive truck, uh, say, uh, if you're from smaller town Texas or even just Texas in general, you'll see people who will show off their wealth not by buying a Lamborghini. That, that's, okay, that's the ex exuberant. But say if you're not that wealthy, but if you have money, you, you may not buy yourself a Mercedes or a uh, Lexus. But what you'd do is you'd buy yourself a King Ranch F-350. And last I checked, uh, not, that was about a, six months ago, I asked a, a friend of mine in the truck business who's a salesman, uh, I asked him, I said, how much does a F, uh, F-350, all things being equal, but just a, a off-the-factory, fully loaded King Ranch F-350 cost? And he said about, he said, I sold one after taxes for about $105,000. 
And I mean, that's a lot of money. Basically, you're buying a truck for what uh, two decades ago or a decade ago would have bought you a nice house or at least a decent uh, middle class house. Anyway, so you manifest your wealth through a car. You manifest your health, wealth through an opulent house. You still do that. You see it in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and elsewhere. So they did that. If you drive through uh, towns uh, that had a lot of cotton, you'd see these beautiful old Victorian homes. you see beautiful old Victorian uh, churches. Uh, in addition to that, too, and this is where I want you to look up towns. Say, think of uh, Caldwell County, which is Lockhart. Uh, Lockhart is famous now for barbecue. It's uh, outside of San Marcos and down uh, south and east of, uh, of Austin on, what, 183 or something like that. Uh, but anyways, Lockhart, I want you to look up and type into a Google search, look up the Caldwell County Courthouse, and I want you to look at the image. And I also want you to do that for Hill County. Caldwell, like I said, Caldwell County, which is Lockhart, is down around on the way to San Antonio or Austin. Hill County is on the way to Dallas, up north of, of Waco. And then also look up uh, McLennan County. And, and I can go on and on on this subject because all of those county courthouses, look at McLennan County, which is Waco, please. That's the one I want you to look out too. Look at Hill County, Hillsboro. But what I'm saying is, is that those counties that were rich in cotton, they manifested it in some of the most fine architecture in the form of county courthouses that you've ever seen. Ultimately, my point is, is that cotton produced a lot of wealthy men. It was not, uh, you, it was not spread equally across the, uh, the stratas. You're going to have sharecropping, tenant farming, and some, uh, some pretty nasty stories. But you can also find, too, a lot of great uh, examples of architecture because cotton produced it and provided it in the form of, of a profit. So anyhow, uh, that brings me to Waco. And at 55 minutes, I think that's enough time for this lecture today. Uh, but I'll pick up with Waco and the city that was or was supposed to be uh, in the next lecture. Thank you.